Good afternoon and welcome. This is a live chat about the height limit in the District of Columbia and cities around the world, brought to you by the National Capital Planning Commission. My name is David Alpert. I am the founder and editor-in-chief of Greater Greater Washington, a website about urban planning, transportation, and other issues that affect the shape of communities in the Washington, D.C. region. Today we have two um, uh, wonderful visitors from London here to talk about the height limit here in London and elsewhere. And this is a lead-in to NCPC's uh, panel discussion this evening at 7 o'clock on this issue. To my right is John Worthington. He is a uh, principal at DEGW Architects and a visiting professor at the University of Sheffield. And Robert Taverner, who is uh, an architect, urbanist, and historian, uh, and uh, has been a, a professor in a number of places, and has been involved also with a number of major development issues and, and sites in London. Welcome. Thanks so much for coming here to Washington, D.C., and for joining us for the chat today. Um, I guess to start with, uh, you both, I know, spent a little bit of time over the last day or, or so, or, or weekend, uh, touring around the, uh, Washington, D.C. When I go to different cities, uh, I often notice things through the lens of, of my experience with urban issues, architecture, and so forth. What have you noticed uh, that you think particularly stands out from your time walking around D.C. so far? Where do you start, Robert? Because Robert had his weekend here. I just arrived. All right. Yeah, no, I, 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 was, I arrived on um, Saturday, so Sunday and Monday I've been walking around. And, and it's actually walking around which has been key for me. I mean, if, if you can walk around a city, you get to understand uh, the, the lay of the, um, the, the spaces and the buildings and get a clear sense of the structure. And I think, actually, for me, D.C. did very well. Uh, it passed lots of tests. It was, a pl it was a pleasure to walk through. I mean, it was a bit windy on Sunday. Uh, but apart we can do about that. <laughs> <laughs> nothing you can do about that. But it was, it was very easy to get around. There was a clear um, legibility, if you like, to the, to the city. You, there were buildings which were big enough, distinct enough, to be able to find one's way around. And of course, with the uh, Mall itself um, running um, uh, east-west through the, the, the heart of the city, one could really step away from um, the buildings and the density uh, of enclosure and really get a sense of it. Um, fantastic culture here, really enjoyed the galleries, so uh, both moving in and out of the spaces was good. But then there wasn't a lot of sense of space once you got out of the mall. I mean, uh, particularly moving north. Um, there's a, some of the streets are very grand. Um, uh, there's a nice quality to them. They've got a good depth, width and height uh, ratio, which is comfortable, and some good quality buildings, certainly. But there was a sort of missing a, a, a sense of small pocket parks, um, open spaces, and so on, where you felt that you could just stop, sit down, uh, take a coffee before moving on. So there was, it's a city of extremes in that way. Absolutely. I was in Washington, I guess, from 20 plus years ago. Uh, and I came in uh, by Amtrak, mm -hmm. uh, an interesting way to come in. Uh, my first interesting thought was, of course, huge change I've seen, very, very interesting. And I could see that even the sort of short distance I had uh, from the station uh, to the hotel. Um, but it's now, of course, part of a metropolitan region. So I was immediately interested in the relationship between DC and the areas surrounding it. Sure. And I began to ask myself interesting questions about what is a capital? And of course, capitals can be many different things. It could be a capital of governance. Without doubt, this is that. It can be a government. A, capital of jurisdiction, without doubt it is that. It could be a capital of culture, and I think without doubt it has got that with the Smithsonian campus, which actually astounded me. It's much more than just four or five buildings. It's a complete campus across everything which is about America, which is fascinating, with a particular emphasis on technology and the way you've science and developed. So I found this interesting and seeing actually a transportation system which was far further developed than what I'd remembered, which of course was a city which was very run down 30 years ago. I was seeing a new place. And I saw wonderful glimmers. I saw the food trucks coming in. 
I saw activity beginning to grow around, and I began to see a different kind of place. So I'm interested to try and understand what is a capital city. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to sense. Wonderful. So we wanted to talk a little bit about your experiences dealing with uh, issues of building heights, because we are here to talk primarily about building heights. And I thought I would start a little bit with uh, discussing the debates that are going on in London or other cities that you want uh, to bring in from your experience. Uh, here, uh, as I think you're aware, we, we have a limit on heights, which is an absolute limit in the uh, main part of the city, just a little bit higher on Pennsylvania Avenue. And then in other parts of the city, generally the zoning uh, restricts uh, the building height more than the federal law does. What is the uh, nature of the discussion about building heights right now in London? Robert, again, because you were actually involved with it. Yeah, no, I, um, as, a, as a consultant, as an architect, and an urbanist, I'm, I'm very much involved in um, uh, where tall buildings uh, are located, their height, um, and, and so on. Um, the, it really became an issue in a big way about a decade ago, really around 2000. Um, until then, um, there had been what we called a pepper potting of tall buildings across London, where, where buildings, particularly residential buildings, some um, commercial buildings, had just cropped up where they'd managed to convince um, authorities or government to be built in exchange for um, some other concession. Um, but the, in terms of a concerted, coherent plan about tall buildings, this came about really with um, a document that was produced under Tony Blair's government, the Labour government, um, uh, and a document called Towards an Urban Renaissance. And it was all about trying to create a compact um, city uh, where, which avoided urban sprawl, uh, which um, was linked to public transportation so that people could get into the city centre uh, to their workplace um, quickly, and therefore the idea of creating nodes, strong foci, where taller buildings would be located. So the whole debate has been about how to focus around important transportation interchanges and to increase height um, in, in those locations. It's been a highly contested um, uh, discussion because, of course, we have a lot of um, high-quality heritage assets, as we refer to them in London. A number of five World Heritage Sites within London, and three in the um, central area alone. And it's, it's been important to balance the visual impact of these tall buildings um, in relation to perceived gains. Now, those perceived gains are, are complex, and it depends which side of the fence you're standing on. I think from the government's point of view, it was the idea of projecting an image of London as both um, a stable um, city, historically, democratically, but also a modern city, one that was embracing the future, and that it had the, uh, the willingness and balance within its um, organization to embrace both the past and the future together. And that's really been the focus for a lot of debate. And John, do you think that that has... Uh has uh, helped London gain something, lose something, or some of each of those? Uh, I think that I'd like to really, my perspective is I come from a broader perspective. I um, got originally involved with the high-rise strategy for Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. Now, Rotterdam was a city which was flattened during the Second World War uh, and celebrated tall buildings, absolutely wanted to build tall. That was what they said was what they were about. It showed them as a new city. But of course, the first thing they brought me in and said, we've got somebody who wants to build a 250 meter high tower. That's not that hard by American standards, but that was a year and a half of their total market uptake. They'd spent nearly 50 years gradually building the vitality of the streets and they were gonna suck it all up a great big tower. So I said, actually, the problem isn't about height, and they wanted to know where should we place these tall towers. I said it was about managing intensification and innovation, right. because tall buildings themselves don't give you identity, just the next tall building gets even bigger than the last one. And actually, what we came up with there was understanding height 
as intensity, not necessarily density, is only going high. Right. And intensity, and I'm sure this is something very important uh, for, for Washington as well, is about the way you use the space. Can you start using space and time together? It's going to be an and then moved on to looking at Dublin, a lovely historical Georgian city. Here, it was all about actually a one story city <laughs> going to three stories was a significant height. Mm -hmm. So, what is height? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a very good point because, you know, it, it, in Manhattan, there are arguments about whether a building should go from 25 to 40 stories. Absolutely. In a place like Wheaton, Maryland, the suburban area near a metro station outside of DC, there, there are people who feel that something over two stories, you know, the height of some of the houses there, is excessive. It, it, it's excessive. From, from their point of view. And of course, DC is a very specific building, and it's got a wonderfully clear set of requirements. So the 1910 Act is, is, is so elegant, actually just those few things it says to control that height. What you then got to do is talk about what goes on at the ground floor and what I call skyscape. Mm -hmm. And that's not very good here, actually, how you do various things about it. Well, and I think you raise two issues that are often um, sort of points, arguments that are often made when discussing the DC height limit. One is you talked about how in Rotterdam, the, uh, the extra building was going to use a lot of the growth uh, potential for the city. Here, one of the challenges that we have, and, and I know some of the European major capitals also, is that uh, there's so much demand for growth and uh, that rents are, uh, for office are increasing rapidly and uh, residential costs are increasing rapidly. Housing is becoming very expensive. And does the height limit uh, impede the ability of the city to provide for more housing and offices to meet that demand. So is it the, is it, are we, do we have the flip side of the Rotterdam issue where instead of a tall building taking away the opportunity for development, we have more demand than the specific heights can accommodate? So you could argue that there was a lot of demand. That demand is changing. And in fact, we're finding different ways of working. <laughs> different ways of lifestyles, actually. Uh, so actually, the demand, we're intensifying the use inside buildings. Mm -hmm. If I walk into many of this building itself, a huge area downstairs, an empty reception area. If I went to New York, I'd see them intensifying. Them. You know, and so I think there's a lot of intensification, which would bring vitality to mm -hmm. the city. I, Robert? I'd just like to, to drop in there, because I think, um, I think it's important to have um, uh, a range of building types within a w within a good city. It's not and uh, some cities. I mean, I live in London, but I also live in Bath, um, a, a world heritage site in, in the west of England, which is a very beautiful Georgian city. So I enjoy those two worlds. You wouldn't want tall buildings in Bath. It's it's something unique about it. The central area of Washington D.C. is unique. It's got a very specific character which is 200 years old. It grew, f obviously, from the L'Enfant, um, uh, Jefferson, Washington initiative. So it's got, there's a special resonance about it. But beyond that central area, surely there is a potential for a range of um, building types. Now, that's not to say that if you were to build taller, it necessarily means skyscrapers of the Manhattan nature. I mean, we have tall buildings in London uh, which go up to 300 meters, which is small by American standards, we think they're very tall. And indeed, 300 meters, um, the Shard, which is just being completed in London, is the largest um, mixed-use building in Europe, I think, at the moment, in, in height. So, and how many, how many floors is that above ground, just so uh, people can get a comparison? 45. OK. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it's, but, but a city, a living, vibrant city, benefits, certainly of the scale of Washington, D.C., in, in offering a range of building typologies. The important thing is to conceive of the city three-dimensionally. It seems an obvious thing to say, you know, one looks at a model, but it's three-dimensionally and also in the sense of when you're walking the streets, what you see. So there are locations in relation to the Mall and so on where it would be wrong to have very visible tall buildings. Elsewhere, it could actually create uh, a very positive skyscape 
um, in the way that John um, was hinting earlier. Some variety in scale, um, as in looking in any natural landscape, can be a positive. Um, so I think it, it's about balance, and it's about judgment, and it's having the right tools to be able to assess what is right and what, is, what would be wrong. And um, by the way, everyone uh, who's watching, uh, if we're live, um, the, uh, for those who are watching while we are live, you can tweet any questions you might like to ask using the hashtag heightenedconversations. Um, and we'll try to get to a few of those questions if we can. One of the um, arguments that's perhaps often made for DC's height limit that also relates to something that some of you have touched on is that uh, there are a lot of neighborhoods outside of the central core that, that would like to see more job growth, more residential growth. They'd like to, to be able to be more than they are. And perhaps by having a limit on things in the downtown area, it prevents the downtown from being the, essentially the only place that there's much office growth and having jobs move to other parts of the city, perhaps uh, immediately adjacent to the downtown. Has that been, was that the experience in, or, or was that in at all something that was going on, a dis part of the discussion in London or in other cities that you're familiar with as far as people saying, how do we direct growth to a certain part of the city versus another? Well, of course, in London, two very important things happen. The city of London, seeing it as the capital of finance, was in this, what we call the square mile. Uh, then you got an American developer, a Canadian, <laughs> who came and they built Canary Wharf. Mm -hmm. That was an uh, absolute classic counteraction uh, to uh, the City of London. What it did to the City of London was stimulate it to say, hey, we've got to do other things. And the second big one, of course, is that many of the functions traditionally moved up to the West End, not in tall tower blocks, because these were the hedge funds, these were the small, high-value organizations, uh, uh, and a lot of the um, natural resource people trading there. That was interesting. They went into old Georgian houses, into a low-rise, high-density area. And then you've got the third, the one which was mentioned, which is across the river, just outside, was the Shard, which uh, I was very involved with, actually. Now, that was a very special building. It's tapers. So although it's very large, it can be mixed use because it has a variety of depths of floors. My view is here, the story is to try and understand is what do functions need? What sort of functions do you want in DC? And what kinds of space does it need? And how much of that is going to be here or in the future is going to be in a distributed city? Because what we're seeing now is polycentric cities, mm -hmm. which gives us a very special view then of what will <laughs> right, and, and I want to hear uh, from Robert, but one uh, immediate thought to your question is that in DC, given the uh, intersection of the federal government and local, there's not always unanimity on what we want the city to be. To some people, they want it to be uh, more of a, a city for residents. Uh, the District of Columbia, the, the DC government's uh, objective would be to diversify its jobs away from federal jobs so it's not as dependent on federal spending. Whereas, from the federal government's point of view, that's not really uh, its priority because it's the federal government. So. Probably, perhaps the answer is to have more right. division because in London we have 33 local planning authorities. Um, and those 33 local planning authorities are often at odds with the Greater London Authority, Mayor Boris Johnson these days, um, who have an overarching role in terms of dealing with where things should go, where height should be, and so on. So I think. Actually, perhaps, yes, more range is good. Westminster City Council, which along with the City of London that John mentioned, and they're the two wealthiest, largest boroughs uh, within central London. Um, Westminster doesn't like tall buildings. It's actually demolished or had demolished buildings that have been built since the Second World War, whereas the City of London is promoting tall buildings. So you get a, then a city of contrast. And you get a city then with very definite character areas. And I think that's part of what we're talking about as well. Maybe what isn't clear to an outsider here for a short while is distinctive character areas. Certainly the Mall um, and some of the other areas around it are, are clearly identifiable. But maybe a city of this scale should have, um, I don't know, a dozen um, different character areas which are decided um, 
by the type of space they offer, the type of activities that cluster around them, and that different types of buildings, some tall, some low, or whatever, are linked to those. So this is the sort of polycentric city that John's referring to as well, which then expresses itself through its activities. And that polycentric city, of course, is very much broader than just the DC territory. However, within the DC territory, there will be character areas, which I think is very important to answer, Georgetown, etc., Dupont Square Circle. You know, this is going to be an interesting way to think about it, I think. Right. Do you think, getting back to um, you, you coming here, and, and of course a lot of other visitors come to the city from many countries and all around uh, our nation, do you, what, what message does it send, in your view, to people looking at the city, um, in particular the places right beyond the mall and right beyond the federal area? We have you know, a lot of these buildings of, of, a, un, of a uniform height. Do they think you know, that, does that mean something? What, what do you think, how do you think people react to that? Well, one good way of always assessing that is to actually see what people take photographs of and send back. They've produced one of those maps of London where, you know, following people's phones to actually see where they take the photographs from um, and what they're looking at and, and d divided that um, against uh, UK residents and so on. It's actually very revealing, actually, what draws people. Um, I mean, historically, of course, there have been famous paintings of both our cities in that sense, and they tend to focus on the big governmental religious uh, monuments. But it's really what makes a city is that next layer in terms of people doing something interesting in the street, something unusual happening, a really beautiful um, small, smaller building, something about the quality of materials and so on. So it, it's understanding those layers of richness and depth which really make a city um, special. So I think to some extent, um, I mean, I don't know DC well enough to be able to comment on that, but I guess I would, if I was here for longer, I would be looking to understand those depths and those layers. And if they don't exist, then that would be a deficit for the city. I think that's very interesting. When I did the work on the sight lines for London, actually, originally, we actually did exactly that. Go to a number of places and begin to see what people were looking at. Now, what you've got a very diverse population now, Mm -hmm. with all sorts of different engines. Many of them, for instance, weren't looking at the Tower of London where you expected them to be looking. They're turning their back and looking at City Hall, the new building. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. The other thing is, so actually it's very hard to say these are the exact things people do. And often we are looking at things from a particular point of view, which is the old constructed view of the kind of establishment. <laughs> Yet we've got a different area out there. What I DC is about, though, is of course a federal capital, which is everybody can be or should feel they can be proud of, and you can certainly sense that with the busloads of people getting out, photographing things. That must be colossally important for what we're talking about, and I guess generating a huge amount of economic wealth here just in terms of tourism coming in here. So you have a big economic generator here through that. Mm -hmm. You need to look after that, I think. Absolutely. And you know, I think that's an excellent point. And it, thinking about what people take photographs of is very interesting. Just as you both were talking, I was thinking that a lot of photographs are of uh, maybe uh, rows of row houses that you know, were built at the same time. And, and uh, there are some that are different colors. There's a few streets where they're all bright colors. And so that leads people to take photographs. And on the other hand, often people take pictures of the largest buildings or the most architecturally distinctive buildings in the city. So maybe that reinforces some of the points you were both making about how you know, uh, it would be good to strive for more diversity of building types because people will choose to admire the biggest and smallest buildings, perhaps more than a lot of the ones right in the middle. Yeah, I think um, it's important for DC to identify what is it about itself that it wants to convey to the outside world. We all see on TVs around the world the Capitol um, and the White House and shots of the Mall and so on, but that's actually most of our um, image of, image of um, the city. Now London, um, on, on, in a quite a different way, is much more diverse. You know, it is to do with its parks, it's to do with um, a range of historic and modern buildings and the river. So all those things actually feed into... I mean, London has the largest number of tourists, I believe, in the world of any, of any city. I think it's 15 million visitors a year or thereabouts. And that is a, has a huge impact, both in terms of wealth, 
but in terms of expectation. And therefore, one thing feeds to another, and it gives um, more variety in terms of you know, the West End theatre, what it can support, which again feeds into urban living and makes it a great city to live in. And um, there's no reason why DC, because of its national importance and therefore international standing, couldn't be um, a similar city if that's what the direction it wants right. to go. New York is certainly that. Right. Um, and I guess most people would choose New York as a destination over Washington because of the variety and the experiences that it offers. Does, in London, the, the fact that it is striving to be a, a financial capital, business capital in other ways, and have sections of the city that do that, do people feel that that detracts at all from the uh, national uh, character of it? Or does the city simply solve that by having them in slightly different areas, like you were talking about before about the polycentric city? How does, do, 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 do people feel that they come into conflict, the two goals are in conflict, or are they really harmonious with each other? I think that is the nature uh, of a global city right. like London. <laughs> it has a, a number of different types of capital within it. Uh, and actually, if you take, there is a wonderful equivalent of a mile almost, which goes from Buckingham Palace almost straight uh, past clubland, <laughs> which is, uh, and government, <laughs> through the law and university with LSE, right down into the business district, ending at uh, the Royal Exchange and the Bank of England. That is the sort of sequential. It's not understood by many people, but it is one great mile, actually, of that is holding London together. But it's all sorts of different distinctive areas. And of course, actually, in big cities, each of us has a different city of which we hardly go to other parts of it. So my city will be uh, the city of education, maybe. You know, another person's city is the city of commerce. Uh, and these are kind of separate areas. In cities like London, they've all got compacted. Right. In American cities, they've got dispersed. And that is our polycentric city. And I think that's quite interesting starting point to think about what is the real essence of DC? But I think right. the, 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 the Sorry, the one thing that um, I would just add to that is that in terms of the City of London itself, the commercial centre, what kills that is that at night um, it doesn't have the same level of vitality as the West End. And again, I think that is the, this focus on the polycentric city is important because what it means is that not only have you got employment, uh, but you've got residential um, as well as shopping and um, all that goes to make um, a, a place a complete entity. Um, and I think the real problem is when you get exclusive places. Um, I mean, you go along Pennsylvania Avenue, I mean, we were shown the FBI site, for example, right. which, you know, that's a fantastic opportunity. But with only one use on it, it kills that block. Right. With a, an active ground floor, residential, commercial, all on that site that part of Pennsylvania and Avia would be absolutely transformed. And the, right. you can imagine that multiplying through a city like this. So you're, you're saying, I, I think that a polycentric city doesn't mean segregating the uses. It means creating what feel perhaps like different cities, but each of which is somewhat self-sufficient, uh, or at least um, has all of the characteristics of a city in and of itself. And it would be the quarters of a traditional right. city. Sure. It's a dominant theme, right. but it's a complete place in itself right. with very good public transport. Exactly. And that's what you're right. much better now. Right. And, and uh, with, the, with the issue about the, um, you know, the, the analog of the mall uh, in, in London or other places, one uh, objection perhaps that I think uh, has been raised to having other areas near downtown but perhaps not right in downtown that have taller buildings or a different character is whether they'll be visible. There's, there's something of a feeling that well, we, you should be able to stand in certain places and look and, and not have uh, the, the feeling of, of buildings or, or different things that aren't the federal city impinging. Uh, does, that, does that ever come up in London, or, or do people simply not feel that it's OK if you can see tall buildings for a financial center, that that's fine? No, definitely it's important and, uh, and a big issue. And um, John talked about these, these views um, earlier. We have, um, according to our policy, our planning policy in London, there are 27 views which are protected. So these are geometrical views, which are defined in width and uh, in terms of um, elevation, in which no tall buildings can actually be located in the foreground of, uh, of a particular target building, like the Houses of Parliament, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, um, or the Tower of London. 
And indeed, in terms of their backdrop, they also have to be regulated. They have to be widely discussed and sometimes aren't allowed. Um, and so that, plus conservation areas and um, listed building requirements, actually creates very definite corrals or clusters where tall buildings are suitable uh, in common ju uh, judgment and where they're not. Now, again, that's all hotly debated, but it means that you get grouping of tall buildings rather than a universal spread of tall buildings, which then gives the city a very definite character. It means that each part takes on a different character, has its own topography, has its own microclimate, um, has its own building types in a way, but at the same time should be a vital place. And we're almost out of time, so John, any th uh, more thoughts? Well, just to say, I think the other thing you were hinting at is the building as an identifier or a marker, the single building, which is unique. Uh, and that won't help with density, but it could be very important. The shard is colossally important because historically the, the route's coming to it. And as you can see it from way out on equivalent to what you call the beltway, the M25 right around. Right. So it has a different level of thinking to it. Then quality of design is essential. Right. That is a superb building, and there aren't enough good buildings. Right. That's a bad so, way of finishing. <laughs> a tall, very un unpleasant building is very different effect uh, than a very, very pleasant one. And, and secondly, Dave, I'd say, and people are very important. You've got to have who, whose city is this? And they will make different cities within these small areas within DC, but it'll be people at the end. Wonderful points. Well, thank you again both for all of your very fascinating insights. Thank you to everyone who's watching live and will be watching on the archive video as well. Uh, again, the National Capital Planning Commission is organizing their uh, panel discussion at 7 o'clock this evening, uh, for those watching live for whom it's still this evening, uh, with these gentlemen and some others from around the world talking about the heights of buildings in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much for joining us.